Hey everybody, it's Josh here again, and today we're going to be talking about hashing and hashing algorithms in the context of information security. I'm going to explain hashing in a way that's easy to understand and that's relatable to some kind of everyday real life activities that people might do. And then after that, we're going to look at some of the different hashing algorithms such as SHA-1 or SHA-256 or MD5 and kind of talk about the differences between them. Next, we're going to talk about how hashing is used to securely store user passwords, and then we're going to do a little bit of an example of how password cracking or hash cracking works in real life. So if you're excited to learn about hashing, go ahead and smash the like button for the algorithm and let's get started. So getting into what hashing is, if we look at the Wikipedia definition, it gets really complicated really fast and it, it it's really hard to kind of wrap your mind around what this thing is trying to say. And because of this, I kind of came up with our own easy to understand relatable definition that explains it pretty well, I think. So a cryptographic hashing function itself is really just a magical blender. This magical blender can blend any amount of any kind of ingredient that you can imagine. And once these ingredients have been blended, no matter how much you put into the blender or how little, a milkshake is created that's the same size every single time. And this part is a little bit more intuitive, but once the ingredients have been blended into a milkshake, there's no way to turn them back into ingredients, just like in real life. If you blend up a bunch of strawberries and ice and vanilla and sugar, for example, there's no way to take that milkshake and turn them back into strawberries or whatever else you put into it. And with our metaphorical magical blender, each milkshake is going to be unique unless the ingredients you put in were exactly the same. So exact same ingredients will yield the exact same milkshake, but if you change the ingredients even a little bit, even like one grain of sugar extra, the milkshake is gonna be different. Like the flavor signature or something about the milkshake is going to be different unless the ingredients are exactly the same. So to try to solidify the idea of creating a hash using any size of any type of data, we can look at our magical blender example here. Say we want to add some more ingredients to our strawberry milkshake, such as five elephants perhaps and we can do that because remember our magical blender can take any size of any type of data so we can put into it whatever we want so let's say we put in five elephants we go ahead and blend the strawberries and everything up and we're still going to get a 16 ounce milkshake it's just going to look different maybe and have some different properties like a different taste and whatnot but it's still going to be the exact same size of 16 ounces also acknowledge the fact that it's impossible to take this milkshake and then deconstruct it to figure out what it's made of. Like we can't take it and be like, this, this smells like elephants and then reconstruct and bring back the five elephants and then reconstruct all the strawberries is impossible. Once that stuff, once the ingredients like the elephants and strawberries and whatnot have been turned into that milkshake, there's no way to reverse it. So to kind of make this idea a little bit more technically solid in your brain, I'll do an actual example using PowerShell and we'll create some actual uh, hashes. So we'll take some data and we'll create some actual hashes. So basically I have two files here. One is just called original recipe, a recipe for strawberry milkshake. And the other file is called new recipe. And this is also a recipe for a strawberry milkshake. And it's the same right now. These are both the same. So we can go to PowerShell and we can say git file hash. And then I will say, I'll do the original first, and then we'll specify the hashing algorithm. Oops, we'll say SHA-1. So this original recipe, we ran it through our, so this algorithm, this is our blender, and this uh, hex file, this is our ingredients, and then this is our milkshake, essentially the output of the hashing algorithm. So we have an output of this, it ends with uh, A645. So now we'll get the file hash of the other file, uh, not original, what am I doing? New recipe, algorithm, SHA-1. And because these files are exactly the same, everything is the same about them, they ended up producing the same hash, as you can see. But say we go to our, our new recipe, and instead of five grams of vanilla, we do like six grams, and then we save it. And then we'll press up, and then we'll get the file hash of the new recipe again, and say enter, and we notice it's it's completely different. Everything about it is completely different from uh, the original recipe. Everything's completely different. So say we say we change this back just to just to check our sanity. We'll get file hash and then we can say it went back to CA645. And then this is the original recipe, CA645. So it went back to what it was before. So say even if we change like um obviously like it's going to change if we change, you know, how many grams of stuff we use but even if we change anything about this file at all like we put like an extra space at the bottom or something like this and we recalculate the hash for the new recipe again it's like drastically drastically different from what it what it was before 
And one more thing I want to explore while we're here. So remember, like you can take the hashing algorithm and you can put any size of any data into it and the output is always going to be the same size. So with SHA-1, the output is always going to be 160 bits. So this is 160 bits. So for example, if we take our, our new recipe, right, this thing, and we make it like much long, much larger, like exponentially larger, larger, just pasting, cutting and pasting. You can see like the line down here, it's getting close to like a million. Is that a million? Yeah. So I'll save this, right? And then I'll compute the hash for the new recipe one more time. And we can see although the hash is different, the hash is it's still the same size. So no matter what you put into what you put into the hashing function, like whatever you're hashing, it's always going to end up being the same size. Likewise, if I empty this out and I, I hash it again, it's it's still going to have a hash of 160 bits. Put a period, hash it again still going to have a hash of 160 bits, although it's different, of course, it's drastically different. The hash is always going to be the same size, depending on the hashing algorithm. And this kind of gets into our next point of kind of discussing the different or more common hashing algorithms that you might see out there in the wild. So there's basically a whole bunch of different hashing algorithms that are used for computing hashes. That is a whole bunch of different types of blenders that you can use to make milkshakes with. There's a lot of rigorous technical differences between the hashing algorithms, but some of the main differences that people tend to like recognize are the size of the resulting hash. So for example, with MD5, no matter how big the thing you put into it, the resulting hash is always going to be 128 bits. And with SHA-1, no matter what you put into it, the resulting hash is always going to be 160 bits. Same with SHA-256, the resulting hash always going to be 256 bits. Another kind of main difference between the different hashing algorithms is the algorithm speed. Not necessarily in seconds, but the computational cost that is incurred whenever some piece of data is hashed. For example, if you hash something with SHA-1, you can expect it to take much longer if you hash it with SHA-256. It really depends on the algorithm though, so if you're doing something that has a lot of computational cost, you suspect you might want to look up the different hashing algorithms or just run tests yourself. There are some algorithms now that are actually considered insecure, like SHA-1 for example. They're considered insecure because there are some instances where you take two separate pieces of data that are totally different and you run one through SHA-1 and then you have a resulting hash and as you run the other piece of data that's different by the way through the same algorithm you would expect to have a totally separate hash but it ends up being the same. So two separate pieces of data through the same algorithm will result in the same hash. And this is called a collision. This is generally bad in the security world. Now, it's not easy to make this happen. It's quite difficult actually, but the fact that it does happen and, and can happen is enough to kind of deprecate the algorithm. That is like stop using it where security is any kind of concern. And the last thing I wanna cover in this video, which is really important, is how hashing is commonly used to store and handle passwords. So oftentimes when you sign up for a new account on a website like on LinkedIn or Facebook or something, oftentimes you need to create your own user account. So you'll enter your username, maybe maybe it's your email address or something, and you'll enter a password. And once you enter the password and say enter to create your account, the web server will receive your password. For example, if you type password one, the web server will, will receive this and it will run the password through a hashing algorithm. So for example, maybe SHA-1 if, if it's like 10 years ago, or SHA-256, which is more secure and it will take that resulting hash it will store the hash in a database with your username so next time when you go to log in the second time when you come back to the site you enter your username and then you enter your password again and the website or the web server on the back end will take that password and it will hash it and it will compare it with what it has for that username's hashed password in the database. If the hash of the password that you typed in matches the hash that they have stored in the database, then it means that you are who you say you are, at least you know the password, and then it will go ahead and let you log in. So websites don't, they don't typically store the actual password in the database is what I'm trying to say. They'll make use of hashing algorithms, hash the password, and then they will store that hash in the database. And I know they use salts and stuff these days, but I'm not gonna talk about salts in the video because it's getting a little bit complicated already. But basically what I want you to take away from this is usually websites will have a database filled with password hashes, not necessarily clear text passwords, but hashes. And remember how I talked about like once you blend the milkshake up and you have the resulting milkshake, there's no way to figure out what the ingredients are. That is, there's no way to really go in reverse and figure out what you put into the blender. The same is true 
generally for hashes, but there is a way to figure out the text or the data that was used to create the hash. Um, it's not a very scientific way. It's just essentially guessing a whole bunch of things until you happen to guess the right text or the right data that makes the hash. And to do that, you need to at least make sure you have the hash of the thing you're trying to guess. So for example, say we broke into a database at LinkedIn, for instance, and we took we took a user's hash. So we have this hash. We don't know what the password is for it, but at least we have the hash. So what we can do is if we know it's a SHA-1 hash, we can just we can just go step by step and just pick random words. We can take the word, compute the hash for the word, and then see if the hash matches our target hash. And on the instance that these two match, we can assume that this is the password that resulted in this hash, if that makes sense. So for example, if we guess cat and we compute the hash, the SHA-1 hash for cat, it ends up being totally different. So we can say, okay, cat is not, cat is not gonna be our password. So say we want to guess dog and we compute the SHA-1 hash for dog, dog ends up being this hash, and we compare the two, these don't match, so we can cross off dog. So we move on to the next word. Uh, so we decide to guess password one, for example. So we compute the SHA-1 hash of password one, it results in this, and we compare this to the hash that we stole, that we stole from the database, and we notice they're the same, so we can assume that this, this hash up here was the result of hashing the word password with SHA-1. So we can assume that this is the password that produced this hash. Now, this is the only this is the only real way that I know of to um, figure out like kind of quote unquote like I'm doing air quotes reverse engineer what a hash is but it's just essentially brute forcing it it's just essentially brute forcing it until you can get a match and it's just basically guessing and guessing and guessing and guessing until you finally guess the right one. This is called password cracking or, or cracking hashes. So yeah, that's pretty much it for hashing and hashing functions. I hope you were able to develop a better understanding on why hashes are useful and actually how they work and whatnot. This video is actually going to be a prerequisite for the, the next video I'm making, which is gonna involve cracking a whole bunch of hashes in it. It's gonna be very cool, but I didn't wanna like explain hashing like in that video and then do the stuff because it was gonna end up being like really long. But anyway, if you enjoyed this video and if you like this content please feel free to like and subscribe if you know anyone who's like studying for security plus or something and they need to develop a better understanding of how hashes work feel free to share this video with them maybe it will help them it'll definitely help me um, but yeah i appreciate you a lot thank you for watching this far and we'll see you next time